Yeah, I'm talking here today about um, the role of civil society in international arms control. I'm especially um, dealing at the moment and already for more than a year with the issue of um, killer robots or more technically autonomous weapon systems. I think it's a very interesting issue to uh, look at the role of civil society and the very, very central role it plays in even setting the agenda, framing issues, and very fundamentally starting an international debate. Well, um, I have a political science background as well, so I'm approaching this a little analytically, as we are obviously here not a symposium of artificial intelligence experts or specifically on the matter. I want to hold it a little abstract, also with a few to be able to generalize on our panel discussion. So my um, attempt in the paper is to understand and explain why um, this civil society in the field of killer robots, autonomous weapon systems, is um, as successful as it is. In order to do that, let me give you a very brief overview timeline of um, what happened. Autonomous weapon systems in general um, are not defined at the moment because that's um, international consensus that do not exist at the moment. Huh? So it's a preventive campaign, if you want to say so. We understand under autonomous weapon systems um, militarized robots that can basically take every form. It can be a refitted tank or a refitted jeep or a swarm of um, vehicles that fly comparable to uh, today's toy drones. Uh, the decisive criteria here is that they have a certain degree of autonomy from human control, that is especially in the critical function of selecting and engaging human targets. So that's the technical part. The international debate, if you want to say so, started between 2004-2006 on a very, very technical level. Uh, it was um, especially um, Professor Arkin of the Georgia Institute of Technology who started to theorize about the um, potential of including moral agency and um, autonomy algorithms. He worked um, from 2006 on with the US military to determine the potential of a military usage of autonomous robots. So that was very much confined debate to artificial intelligence experts at the time, but sparked among the academic experts um, opposition movements. And it actually started here in um, Great Britain. Noel Sharkey published in 2007 in The Guardian an article. He is a roboticist by profession. He um, published an article in The Guardian warning um, against the dangers of autonomous weapon systems and proposed strong international regulation. Uh, this was the decisive step in this very first phase because through publishing in the newspaper he reached a kind of mainstream. Um, for that it were all artificial intelligence journals which of course have a very narrow reach uh, through The Guardian he reached another kind of community. Uh, he also reached um, arms control campaigns. Um, and um, the year afterwards, in 2008, I believe, for example, the Landmines Action Campaign, as the name says, a campaign that uh, dealt with a uh, um, ban on landmines, joined in a call to ban or preventively ban autonomous weapon systems. We have here a very um, interesting factor that I did, uh, identified, and that's my um, ultimate goal in this phase of my PhD research to um, identify factors for successful campaigning here, um, that we have the benefit in the arms control sector of pre-existing networks. Uh, we have activist networks like the cluster munitions campaign, like uh, landmines, um, actors who really know how to do it. Now they have the knowledge there, the personal, they have done it in other issues before. They know the venues to the government, they know the international platforms and um, a lot of experience in the activist field here. Uh, that's a real asset 
So when landmines action calls for something like that, it is of course listened to in its network. Um, you activate a lot of um, other actors as soon as somebody takes up this issue. Um, and um, that's indeed what happened in the arms control community, in the international arms control network, if you want to tell it this way. Increasingly more actors, of course this is still a very inside discourse, but increasingly more actors become aware of the issue and take uh, it on. And in 2010, we had um, the first transmission, if you want to say so, to the international stage by a um, report of the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Killing, who mentioned um, lethal autonomous weapon as a problem on which the international community has to look in. So, with this introduction into the United Nations agenda, where states had to deliberate on that, take positions, you suddenly, of course, attracted also the attention of the big players, I want to say so. Uh, you have um, Pax Christi or Pax um, joining on the issue, publishing a report on autonomous weapon systems in 2011. You have in 2012 um, the British NGO, Article 36, very influential um, arms control NGO here, and very big success, considering that it all started with um, roboticists. Um, in 2012, Human Rights Watch published a landmark report uh, called Losing Humanity and called internationally um, to be aware of the legal problems and the ethic problems involved in autonomous weapon systems. Uh, as soon as you have Human Rights Watch as a really major player, you can attract a lot of uh, journalist attention. Um, it is not surprising that the issue gains some traction here. And indeed, um, in October 2012, Human Rights Watch published this report. November 2012, the US Department of Defense issues Directive 3000.09 in which it effectively um, bans, you cannot say, but it puts a moratorium on the implementation of uh, autonomous weapon systems into the US um, services. That means it gives the first definition, what do we understand out, uh, um, under autonomous weapons, and it says, as we are not um, sure at the moment uh, what to do, we want to remain um, at a level of human control that is acceptable at the moment. So. They, um, for the moment, postpone autonomous weapon systems, fully autonomous weapon systems, um, until 2020 or something, and um, have thus opened, first of all, a big policy window, of course, in the United States, but also internationally. Uh, we are now at the moment where a lot of um, flux, and um, theoretically, something could change because we are at the very beginning of a process. At the moment, you wouldn't have a lot of losers if there would come some kind of international regulation or ban. And um, yeah, it's very important that they reach this um, policy directive already to not create any sunk costs in an issue. Uh, 2013 then, a couple of months later, um, in London, in Britain, a uh, network of NGOs um, join, um, launched a campaign to stop killer robots. Human Rights Watch, Article 36, and a lot of other NGOs from all around the world joined this platform to funnel their resources and coordinate their advocacy. And not the least of which also gained some social media attraction and publicity. Because until then, it was often called very technical lethal autonomous weapon systems or something like that, and that's of course not very handy for headlines. While when you suddenly can start a, a talk about killer robots, I bet that has some journalistic attraction. Yeah? <laughs> so, and yeah, it's a major framing success when you have a lot of actors in the network starting to, terms, uh, uh, starting to talk in terms of killer robots. Because that's an easy term now that will probably um, transmit through the institutions and it also causes, and that's also what I say, um, immediate instinctive um, yeah, emotional reaction I want to say. Uh, if you hear about killer robots, 
most people would instinctively say we don't want something like that. Uh, that's general population, that's also within the institutions of the government. Um, and um, very important here is that um, through these actions, the campaign succeeded to change the type of the issue. It was in the very beginning, as I said, a very technical issue between um, artificial intelligence experts that wasn't very attractive to most people. Now, they were talking about killer robots and about ethics. Uh, that's something where you can have an instinctive reaction to. It's an easy issue, we say. And um, that's easier to sell and that's easier to um, lead people to the attention and reaction that the campaign would like them to have. Very important here also the celebrity support. We have um, a lot of important and well-connected people joining the call. We have Jody Williams from the Landmind uh, campaign, uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, a lot of other laureates joining. Of course here, um, Stephen Hawking signed a public letter, Elon Musk. And every time people like that do or say something, journalists are going to write about it. Uh, it has really some supportive function. And um, I fear some data. We have, um, unfortunately, of course, since it's not really an existing issue at the moment, um, very limited data, but we have this one Carpenter survey. And uh, it um, conducted a little research on the public opinion in the United States on lethal autonomous weapons. So we see we have in the um, general population a clear majority that says, even so, you have to say people were asked like that, they uh, received a little explanation, but they are certainly no experts. Uh, but they say just instinctively, that's all right, we do not want that. Uh, even more importantly for my point here, you have in the very institutions, yes, in the very institutions that would be in charge of employing these machines, an even stronger um, yeah, distrust of lethal autonomous weapon systems. That's a um, survey by military status. We can see here people who are currently active in the military or served previous, uh, previously are distinctively more opposed to autonomous weapon systems than the general population. So that means the very people in charge of doing that are very skeptical about that. And that's certainly also benefit for the campaign that you have a lot of um, yeah, supporting forces also within the institutions. Uh, same is true for um, political active people. Well, this graph shows the stronger your political alignment now, the more liberal or the more conservative you are, the more likely you are to um, be against um, against uh, the graphic is unfortunately a little not formatted. But anyway, um, it tells you the more politically convinced you are, the more you are against um, autonomous weapon systems. And that's, of course, important to the political side, because the more um, politically convinced you are, the more likely you are to vote. So voters are not convinced of the issue. Another factor, as I already said, um, you have a lot of connections in place. That's one attempt I made here to um, visualize the network, what we're talking of. We have in red the um, killer robot network, if you want to call it this way, and the um, graphic shows the website connections among the actors. Uh, it's one way to um, um, yeah, represent a knowledge network here. And we say it has a lot of connections to the cluster munitions network and to other um, arms control networks. And they all work together and are linked to the United Nations. And that's a very interesting thing I will close with. United Nations. Um, which provide the framework for a lot of talks at the moment that are going on on the state side um, within the Convention for Conventional Weapon Systems. Um, they provided as information sources for the most time until very recently, mainly sources that are connected to some kind of um, the campaign platforms. Uh, so the campaign, the civil society was able to be the prime information provider for all the state actors that are now starting to deal with the issue. 
simply because everything else is very technical, artificial intelligence, um, information that's not very accessible to governmental decision makers, of course. So by taking this kind of information monopoly, they are certainly very um, able and successful in determining and framing the issue development. Yes. And um, that's only a little overview of what we have at the moment. Um, currently, 22 countries support the ban. Not um, the most important ones, of course. <laughs> Not surprisingly. But the point here is that none of these countries in the killer robot debate says we want to have them. Uh, or we are actively opposed to a ban. The argument at the moment is we don't need it because they do not exist. Uh, so they have already um, managed to frame it in a way that nobody really wants to be against them. And that's certainly a success. Uh, thank you. Good. Thank you.